Hi everyone and welcome to tonight's event called District of Displacement. My name is Jenny Gathright. I'm a reporter at WAMU and DCist. And tonight we're going to be talking about Residue. It's a film released in September by a Washington DC born and raised writer, director, Marawi Garima. Hopefully you all have watched it on Netflix at this point, but I'll give a short synopsis. Um, the film chronicles an aspiring filmmaker named Jay who returns to his native Washington DC to find that his old neighborhood has gentrified beyond recognition. Um, so gentrification, the displacement of black people, rapid neighborhood change is really a theme that runs through the film. And of course, as you all probably know, throughout the past two decades of DC history, but the movie's also about so much more than that. It's about childhood, friendship, what it means to care for each other and for your community and how pe people can really engage with their past to understand what to do next. And so I'm hoping we're gonna get to a bunch of topics related to that in our conversation tonight and some of the details behind how the film was made. Um, but first I wanna just uh, say some notes about how things will work tonight. Uh, first of all, questions. I'm hoping to spend the last 15 to 20 minutes of the conversation focused on questions from all of you in the audience. So. If you have a question that you wanna ask our panelists tonight, please use the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen to ask that question, type it in. And you don't need to wait until the conversation's wrapping up. Actually, it's super helpful if you get your questions in early so that my lovely colleagues, Alexia and Maddie, can moderate them as they come in and make sure there aren't duplicates and then send them to me. Um, second, we're gonna have live captions for the event. So if you wanna use those, you can select the closed captions option at the bottom of your Zoom window. I think there's like a three dots that has more and you can get it there. Um, and shout out to Gianna, who's gonna be typing those captions in real time. Uh, and third, donations. Uh, DCist and WAMU are nonprofit local news organizations, and we rely on the support of the community to make our journalism possible. So if you feel like this event tonight is providing you a service, I would encourage you to donate at dcist.com slash give. So without further ado, I wanna go ahead and introduce our panelists and have them appear on the screen. Uh, so first we have Marawi Garima, the writer director of Residue. Thank you for coming and making the time. Hello, hello, Jenny. Thank you for having me. Appreciate y'all very much. Uh, we also have Obi Nachuku who plays Jay in the film. Thanks for coming, Obi. Thank you, thank you for having me. And we have Dennis D. Lindsay, the actor who plays Delante. Thanks for being here. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having us. Um, so I wanna start with you, Marawi. Uh, could you bring us back to the moment, both where you were like in the world and also the emotional space that you were in when you decided, okay, I'm gonna make this film. Um, kind of when the, idea, when the film went from an idea to like a commitment. Um, and how did you decide that the timing was right for this project? Um, yeah, I mean, so I was in my, my second, I was going to my second year of film school. I was finishing up my first year of film school in LA. And basically um, I had been away from DC for a whole year. And so, you know, I, I went back um, to visit family and like, you know, just kind of, I don't know, just kind of uh, take my summer break. But I mean, seeing how much the city had changed in a year, really, it really was a, a devastating experience. You know, I, we had known about gentrification, like we, we, we were already, you know, kind of frustrated about it. But I think just seeing like how drastically things could change and how fast, you know, everything was being obliterated, uh, it, it became very like, very visceral and real and like physical for me. And so I felt that, uh, you know, the need to really try and figure out some way, you know, to step into the fray, so to speak, you know. Um, and I, I think that's kind of when the story was born in a, in a real, you know, rough way. Uh, I started just kind of writing down ideas. And it wasn't until I got back to school that I started writing in earnest kind of over that next year, you know, in my second year of film school from the summer of 2016 to the summer of 2017. And then really like, it was it was really a rush, you know? So like we started filming in the summer of 2017, basically a, a unfinished first draft of the script, you know? Although we didn't know it was unfinished at the time, but you know, that's kind of how we were moving. Got it. Um, 
Obi and Dennis, I want to bring you both in too, um, because I understand that you're both from the area as well. Um, so maybe if you could just start by both sharing where you're from, what your relationship is to DC as a place, um, and how you came to be a part of this project. And maybe let's start with uh, you, Dennis, because I understand that you and Marawi were college roommates. Is that right? Yes, yes. Um, Dennis Lindsay, I was born and raised in the southeast part of Washington, DC. Um, uh, D.C. to me, it's, it's home. When you think about D.C., anybody who's from D.C. area know that it's home. It's our city. Um, people from D.C. sense to have a chip on their shoulder. And it's it kind of like the representative as well, too. So I feel like with this film being a part of this film, it, it was it was very much a thankful to me. And I was blessed to be a part of the film because it was D.C. because I am D.C. I was born and raised in it. I've seen everything that went on with the film. So being a part of it and actually having Morali, who was from D.C. as well, and we actually were college roommates together. We lived across from each other in the same house. So we already had that bond prior to even shooting the film. So that's how we actually connected. Mm -hmm. And so what was the moment when Morali reached out to you about the film and, and then you came to, to be one of the lead actors? Um, funny thing is, Marawi, after Marawi transferred from Florida a and we connected off and on throughout the years. So he was actually in California with our other roommate who lived with us, driving from California to D.C. and called me, telling me that he was shooting the film. He, him and the other roommate was driving from California. If you notice that in the beginning of the film, if you ever saw the film, when he's recording on the road, he's actually recording and driving from California to D.C. and called me on the way told me he was shooting the film. My thought was, why are you even driving from California? But once he, I got that out the way, I was all with it. I didn't even know what the movie was about. I was just happy to, to get a link up with Mo again, to see him again, to actually be a part of not even knowing what the film was about, anything. I was just like, let me know when and where it'll be, and I'll be there. Yeah, no hesitation. That's awesome. Um, and Obi, what about you? Tell me where you're from and, and how you came to be involved in the project. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I'm originally from uh, Northwest. I grew up a town uh, at Kennedy Street area. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Um, but I also grew up for uh, more like more than half of my life in Prince George's County, Maryland, and Largo. Uh, and yeah, so I got a. I was working on a play uh, with a, with another actress who actually auditioned for this film, and she texted me. She auditioned for Blue, and she texted me and said, hey, they're looking for the lead for this film, and, uh, you know, I think it'll be right for you. So she sent me Marawi's number. I reached out to Marawi, went into Sankofa, uh, and did, a, did my audition. Did another audition with Talene, who plays Blue, I think a few days later, um, and maybe like a week. Uh, after I did that audition, Marawi reached out to me and said, hey, would you still like to play a part? And I was like, yeah. So that's how that came about. Cool. Well, Actually, I think, I think oh, go ahead, Marawi. Go ahead. All right, yeah, I think it's important to emphasize just like kind of um, the, the thing that really stood out, you know, about OB is the fact that like, you know, we were asking a lot of people, you know, in the first place, cast, crew, you know, parents, you know, who donate like their kids, like, you know, locations and all that stuff. But like, we were really asking a lot of the lead actor, you know, because we needed two weeks straight, you know? And like I said, like we, we didn't have resources, you know what I mean? Like we weren't offering him a paycheck, you know what I mean? We were offering him a chance to like, sure, take a chunk, you know, take a bite into a large project and like, you know, test his metal or sharpen his skills and all those kinds of things. But really, you know, outside of that, it was a major commitment, you know what I mean? And so, to have somebody who's like, I can give you as much time as you need because like I'm committed to this. I want to design my life around this. It was it was literally the missing piece. Like we, it it took us months of pre-production, you know, and the whole time the missing piece was lead. We didn't know how we was gonna do it. You know, I was I was about to act in at a certain point. I don't know if I ever told y'all that, but you know, I'm always ready to do whatever. It's got to get done. But like, yeah, OB saved the day. Hmm. I know part of that, having fewer resources for production meant that you guys were on a really tight timeline. Um, so I wanna ask kind of all three of you, what was it like knowing that the timeline was tight? How did you kind of like lock in and, and get that chemistry as, as actors and as a team um, quickly? Like what was the way that you, you all achieved that? 
Well, I mean, it was rough and tumble. I mean, we had to figure it out as we went. Cause you know, you, you would like to have, if you have a budget, you would like to have time to rehearse. You know what I mean? You had like to have time to like really throw it up, you know, uh, in, in, you know, just in rehearsal to really see what the story looks and feels like to get the characters time, the actors time to relate to each other, to get to know each other, especially Dennis and OB who are playing like these two lead characters. But like one, like I said, the script was incomplete. I was writing the script as we went. We had no time for rehearsal and really, I mean, the shooting was the rehearsals. Like we had maybe a couple minutes as, you know, our cinematographer Mark G. Rutnam was lighting the scene. I have some time to like sit and talk with them, you know, to like run through the lines, really to get the lines in their minds and to know what the scene was about, but never really to like, you know, really um, rehearse in order to like, you know, make it better and make it, you know, feel good. You know, we, we didn't have a lot of that time, which kind of speaks to what they, what they kind of, gave the project which was so you know this naturalistic performances which they which they contributed because you know they didn't know each other you know what i mean like they didn't know each other before we started filming but you watch the film and you you feel a relationship there so you know and, and y'all can talk about it you know what i mean we had to resort to a couple of different things to like make it work but you know i actually want to focus on the the two characters that you portray and they're the dialogue between them because um, it introduces this really important meta conversation, right? About who owns the narrative, who has storytelling power. I'm thinking of a particular scene. I mean, I feel like they have a few conversations and they kind of crescendo through the film, but there's one scene where um, Jelante is asking Jay, you know, what's, what's the purpose behind this film that you're making? And, and uh, Jay says something that I actually hear journalists say a lot, um, which is that, you know, um, he's just trying to give a voice to the voiceless. And Delante responds, basically cutting down the premise of that statement saying, who's voiceless? Who are you talking about when you're saying who's voiceless? Um, I wanna know maybe from you first, Marawi, like how did that back and forth come to emerge as such a central theme in the story? And how did you as a writer director handle that tension over community ownership of the narrative yourself as you were making the film? Yeah, I mean, um... If you, you know, like I said, I went to film school in LA, like everybody I went to school with, that's how, that's how they talk. That's, that's, you know, that's the idea is like, we all here, you know, like this kind of real liberal, you know, kind of, you know, environment and everybody believes film will save the world. And, you know, the idea is that like, we want to go, you know, it's, it's a really, I mean, it's, 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 it's it, it, it is embroiled in this whole white savior complex kind of idea that we can go into any community you know, and like go save these people from whatever they might be having a problem with. I'm with a lot of, I went to school with a lot of uh, folks like that. And I just felt that like in general, the whole thing is so kind of erases, erasive of the people who, who they're going to go help in the first place, you know? And, uh, and I, I don't know, I feel like um, for me, it was important to kind of push back against that, you know what I mean? In my, in my first utterance in this project to really say that like, you know, um, you know, people, people um, don't be so sure of yourself as a filmmaker, you know, the people you intend to go save actually, you know, by telling the story so-called could actually tell the story better than you could, you know what I mean? And in fact, coming in to be able to tell their story is massive privilege that they don't have. The idea is that you have, it's only the fact that you have the privilege and ability to come tell it before them, you know, which is the issue. If you really care, you know what I mean? There's so many other ways to really kind of, uh, in a wholesome way, help them to tell their story or really enable them, you know, beyond what they're, you know, materially able to do. The whole thing is super just backwards, you know, but like that's, that's kind of the idea that's um, engendered in film schools around the country, you know, go give a voice to the voiceless, you know, and it's, it is, uh, it's just a continuation of this white savior kind of complex that, you know, so many um, storytellers, filmmakers, and apparently journalists kind of work with. Yeah, Dennis, I wonder if you have anything to add here. Um, as someone who uh, is from the city and who was playing that voice of Delante, who was kind of pushing back against that narrative. Well, Delante, in that particular scene, Delante had a sense of being a protector of the neighborhood because I'm saying whoever knows the synopsis of JJ left to go to film school and when he comes back, everything is different, but he has this idea of writing the story or writing a movie about the neighborhood. And with Delonte was still there with all the years that Jay was gone, Delonte was still there going through everything that he went through. 
he kind of took offense to Jay saying that he was giving a voice to the voiceless and he was talking to somebody he grew up with, he knew. So Delonte kind of took that to events like, who, who, who do you believe is voiceless? Like, what makes you think that we're voices because you, you feel like you can write a movie about the neighborhood that you left? Why? What makes you think I can't write a movie about it? What makes you think that we can't speak on our own terms about it? And I think that's what Marawi was getting to as well. Like, it's those who believe or have a gist of what they believe the neighborhood can say or the people in certain neighborhoods can't speak for themselves. Well, all we need is just to do it and have the opportunity to. Everybody can think they can tell our story, but nobody can tell our story better than ourselves. So that's what I feel like what Delonte was doing. Or Delonte had the feeling of no disrespect to Jay when he came to him wanting to write the film. But what makes you think that real voices, we can we can write this movie or tell the story better than you can because we've been here. You just coming back and seeing things that you think has happened. Mm -hmm. The film takes place on Key Street in Eckington. Um, and I understand, I, I heard an interview, Marari, that you had a screening that was basically just for the Q Street community to see the film. Is that right? It was a, it was a family and friends screening that we had at okay. Sankofa. So it was like, you know, cast, crew, and then also Q Street folks who, of, the, of those who can make it. But no, we, we have yet to do the screening that we really wanted to do, which is like a, you know, one just for, for the neighborhood, you know. Um, we have a, a driving screening coming up at RFK. But, you know, even that's not really, we thought we'd get like a, you know, close off the street, get a big screen, you know what I mean? But there's like so much red tape and so much kind of stuff involved with that. But we, you know, and then also COVID kind of, you know, killed the our ideas of what a DC release really would look like. But, you know, I think that like, we're going we're gonna to do something like that. But yeah, we had a really beautiful screening where like people came out, people I haven't seen in years who, who just came out and really you know, kind of blessed the project in a beautiful way. Mm. Is there a piece of positive feedback from that group of people um, who sort of have that personal experience that's really connected to the film that you'll always remember? And then I wonder on the flip side of that, if there's a specific piece of criticism um, from the community that you really carry and take seriously too. Yeah, you know, um, that day it was really beautiful because I do carry with me my own insecurities, you know what I'm saying? like trying to tell my story in the same way as Jay, you know, it's, it's very much about my life. And um, I carry my own insecurities about, you know, coming back to my neighborhood after many years with the camera, you know, how, how would it, you know, will I be received? Uh, it never played out in the same way as residue. You know, I was received with open arms. People were very happy to participate, very happy to help birth the project. Um, and when we screened it at Sankofa, man, I was touched, you know, they really claimed it, you know, and we're saying like there was an old, old, older gentleman who was saying like, this is our story, like this is the story of our neighborhood as he remembered it, you know, and of course it's only one part of it, you know, nobody could say because residue exists, the story of Q Street has been told, you know, we would, we would hope that many more stories would come out to really, you know, flesh out the entire, you know, this really complicated story of this one area and then many many more to tell the you know larger stories about all the all the black stories that are swirling around in dc way and to be told you know um it's really only black folks who get one shot at telling the story of an entire people you know or an entire city but uh but yeah it was it was beautiful in that way and i i was able to kind of put to rest some some of my 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 worries you know what i'm saying about was i was i exploiting was i you know was I misrepresenting, you know, was I, you know, was my perspective incorrect and like all these kinds of things. Of course, that's never fully resolved, you know, it's not a perfect process, you know, and um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still critical of my, of my own process in interesting ways, but I think that, you know, so far nobody has come to me in a way that Delante has gone to Jay, although that is a character that I wish on every neighborhood. That's a character I wish exists everywhere. Delonte to me is critical for black people everywhere, you know, especially culturally speaking, you know, somebody who, who does challenge the filmmaker, you know, who does question his intentions and his motivations, you know, who does, you know, a gatekeeper, a cultural gatekeeper, you know, to say, you know, I don't trust you, you know, or your motivations, you know. Uh, and I'm not taken in by the cameras and the lights and all that other kind of stuff that comes with the Hollywood you know, machine. Mm. Um, another thing I wanted to ask about 
um, was another sort of theme or tension that kind of is the, the meta narrative of the film. And it starts with the voiceover um, as we're sort of headed in and as Jay is driving um, about extinction and archeology span versus like activism and film as activism. Um, I mean, in interviews and, and in some of the promotion for the film, I've, I've seen you discuss the, this as the work of capturing your community before it disappears. Um, but there are, of course, organizers in the city who are actively, you know, organizing, fighting gentrification as we speak. And I think there's this question in the beginning of the film where uh, the voiceover basically says, like, you thought a film could save us. Um, and I wonder what you see as your relationship as filmmaker to those activists who are doing that organizing work um, now, and then how you might want to see that relationship evolve in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think organizing work is, you know, it's kind of like the way to go. It's like the answer, you know, it's like, if anybody asks me, what do we do? You know, the answer is organize, you know, and like, I think that like de-gentrification efforts, you know, and, you know, anti-gentrification, there's, there's people who can speak on that, you know, who who actually have, you know, a, a path forward that can bring about material changes in people's everyday lives, you know, and material improvements. Um, if they're able to organize around those things effectively. The film, to me, you know, sure, it's an important arena to be in, but at the same time, like film, the effects of film is dubious, you know, like it's, it's immeasurable, you know, or it's, 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 it's unquantifiable, you know. I think that like so many, it goes back to the whole, you know, what, what people, you know, these kind of um, white saviors think their films would do for people. You know, like the thing is that like, you can't guarantee it, you know, like nobody on Q Street's life was changed because Residue was out on Netflix, you know, in a material way, you know, they're still bombarded by the very material and, you know, day to day, you know, frustrations and struggles that they were before I made the film or thought to make the film, you know, so I think that, you know, that's important for me to hold in my mind and all filmmakers to, to, you know, to recontextualize the idea of like the possibilities and effects of film. At the same time, you know, we know that like film is destructive, has total destructive power around the globe, culturally, historically, you know, in your ideas of yourself, distorting your figure, gr grotesque representations of black people, which have, you know, uh, dogged us from, you know, for the last hundred years, you know what I mean? So we know that it's a battle that we got to step into, you know what I mean? Like we know like as black filmmakers, it's something that we have to, to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, 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 to get a hand on, you know, in order to, to fight back on that cultural battlefront, you know, like that's, you know, that is very real and necessary and physical and material, you know what I mean? But it's, it's a very long game, you know, it's not the same as being a teacher, you know, it's not the same as being, you know, a nurse, for example, or a doctor, you know? Um, so that's my idea. Yeah, in the beginning, the idea is like, it's a ghost of the neighborhood, you know, Jay's too late. Jay was not able to save his neighborhood. It's the ghost saying, you thought you could save us. You really thought you could. Um, in fact, actually to me, it's Demetrius, you know, it's, if Demetrius was talking, that would be, that would be what he would say to Jay. Mm. Dennis, I want to actually ask you your thoughts on it, because one thing I was thinking about is kind of the way that we think of like stages. Um, and I think in doing a lot of reporting around this topic, um, the conversation is different from neighborhood to neighborhood. And kind of one thing um, I hear a lot from folks in Southeast DC, where I know you grew up, um, is you go to community meetings there and folks are kind of bracing for what's to come, right? Um, and it's kind of a different story there than it is in Eckington near, you know, what's now called Noma, where, you know, the NPR headquarters has come up and you have all these office buildings and a bunch of, you know, redevelopment. Um, that sort of stuff, I think the fear for folks in other parts of the city is that's kind of more on the way. Um, and I wonder if you have reflections in the making of this film and Obi, feel free to chime in as well um, on kind of like how you thought through like the film in relationship to the parts of the city you know best. Well, speaking on just the, I guess the reconstruction, if you may say, of Washington DC, um, my past have been, been preaching it for years that basically just saying like, if the change is going to come, if you don't have it, just make sure you buy, buy, buy your property because they're getting ready to wipe us out. And just even, I just remember just 
even going to, to college and then coming back home for a break. A new building is tore down. You come back home for a break. The new building is up. And just the change and then everything just and – and you think it's a small amount of time, but it's been planned for years ahead. And we just started – it's just going into effect right now. So with that, just living in D.C. and just seeing things the same, and then you go for a certain amount of – a small amount of time, and you come back, and it's totally different. Or neighborhoods that you've been around or grew up in, and they've, they've been told that, yeah, we're going to rebuild it or make it better so you all can move in. When we rebuild it, then next thing you know, the mortgage and rent is high, and the people who were there before are able to afford living there again, which get pushed out further to PG or further down south and other quote unquote gentrifiers move in and take over the neighborhood. So it's slowly but surely been happening, but it's like now it's starting to hit more because A, I'm a little bit older, I start to understand more, and this film kind of explains and shows it all. It shows it all. Even though if you don't think it shows it, it's people who see things that we didn't see in the film that tell us about the film like that. I didn't even peep that. Or I didn't even pay attention to that even making the film. So with that, I feel like with the film, it explains a lot and me just going through it and living through it. I related to it very well. That's why I feel like with the film, it wasn't it wasn't hard to to become the film because I, I was already living in or was a part of it in the beginning anyway. Yeah, I mean, um, I kind of just share the frustration that Jake um, feels in the film. I mean, I, I remember around the time we were shooting the film, I drove up to the house that I grew up in just to kind of check out the area and see what it was like. And, you know, the just the, the, the demographic in that area obviously had changed. Um, and I, you know, I did my Google search about like the pricing, housing prices in that area. And the house that I grew up in, I think my dad paid like, 190 for it back in like 88 or something like that and that house is like i think about eight hundred and sixty five thousand dollars right now you know what i mean which is crazy and I, you know you just see all the things going on in the city and it's like sometimes i don't know who to be mad at i'm frustrated but it's like who do i direct this frustration towards you know what i mean um and so you know in context of the film, you know, I think in playing this character, I was just like drawn from, you know, a lot of times people ask me, where did you go to play this character? You know, what, we, where did you, what kind of research did you have to do? And a lot of it was in front of us, you know what I mean? I didn't really have to go anywhere too far, you know what I mean? Um, to find some inspiration um, to play the character. Um, everything was happening right in front of us. So, um, you know, it, it's frustrating to see, you know, uh, Granted, these people, you know, gentrifiers have their right to, you know, kind of live where you want, really, you know, um, but it is frustrating when you think about how, you know, everybody doesn't get to benefit from what they get to benefit from, you know, the people that have been here don't get to benefit from, you know, what the gentrifiers get to benefit from. So I share in that frustration. Um, and like Marawi said, I don't, you know, there are people who, know the you know the logistics and you know about how to move forward and and, and sort of quell gentrification if you will um but you know i think for me with this film it, it's just an expression of how a lot of people feel you know and uh yeah you know i, I share in a lot of that mm, thanks of course, um, you know, the film, it, a lot of it does center on the change of the neighborhood, but there's also so, so many other pieces to it, um, just about how Jay grows up, uh, his community, his neighborhood. Um, there's also a lot of, a lot of pain um, that is shown on screen um, and a lot of tragedy, whether that's um, the carceral system, whether um, that's with Mike getting killed um, and the pain we see of his mother. Um, and Marawi, I've heard you talk in interviews before where you've said, you know, that black pain, seeing black pain on screen, it's easy to exploit. Um, and in a lot of film and also journalism for that matter, um, it does seem like the story can become exclusively about pain or powerlessness, or it feels like that pain is put up for consumption. Um, and I was wondering kind of how you thought through um, how you were going to portray um, that very real and raw pain um, while kind of, you know, avoiding um, what, what other films tend to do um, and how you kind of thought through that. Yeah, I think that like, um, you know, once the pain becomes a spectacle, you know, you're in that trap or you're in that, 
you're in that you're you're in that that um, that thing which we find so many storytellers you know exploiting you know it's true like black pain and black misery it's like it's like oil you know what i mean people just kind of sit down in these you know in black neighborhoods and just kind of extract all this you know bankable resource you know it's a bankable you know kind of um endless source you know it's endless because of the country we live in this racist you know kind of society that we live in black misery is really a, a endless source and you can you can you can count on it being there and you can count on it being worth something you know you can count on it being you know highly exploitable and bankable and so the idea is that like you know for me i didn't want to focus on things that like you know kind of um i didn't want to focus on you know for example like mike's death you know what i mean because one i don't have the you know i don't have <laughs> i don't know if i even have the um surely i do you know I, we're also kind of trained by Hollywood to, to, to be able to show, you know, kind of violent imagery so well, I probably could have done a good job at it. But for me, the idea was, you know, what, how does this pain reverberate outwards? You know, how does Mike's death reverberate in his community? You know, how does it play on the face of like Jay, you know, and then his attempts at a new relationship with Delante or, you know, Tanya, you know, Mike's mother, you know what I mean? Like for me, that's more interesting. It's, it's all played out anyway. You know, black death is so played out. Everybody's so, you know what I mean? That's the first thing they go to. We see it everywhere in every book, every comic, every TV show, every time we turn the news, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's nothing new there. There's nothing new I could have contributed, even if I had wanted to, you know? To me, it's more interesting to say, okay, well, how does it play out in the, in the larger community, you know, and also at, at OB's attempts to kind of reconstruct, you know, what he remembers about the community. You know, how does it kind of sever his, you know, his few remaining ties, you know what I mean? His chances at, at capturing his community. Um, to me, that, that that's much more interesting and much more productive, you know, and fruitful anyway, you know, um, why, you know, why focus on, on, you know, <laughs> on, you know, why go down that, that path, which is so well trodden, you know. Or why, why show us that, that graphic image? Yeah, why show people, you know, even if they want to see it, you know, and that's part of the sickness, you know what I mean, that you don't want to feed into, you know. Mm -hmm. there's nothing new there there's nothing there for us i think another piece of the film that really runs through it is anger is jay's anger and his sort of negotiation in in some ways with blue about that anger and and also um just that last scene by the reservoir um where these two white guys are walking and they specifically cross the street to avoid him um and jay's anger spills over he runs over he beats one of them up um and we end with the opposite of resolution like we don't know what, what's happening jay is running from the cops um why did you make the decision to end the film that way I mean, you know, every black person in this in this in this Zoom or anybody who's watching this will have, you know, will know that experience, you know, very well. You know, like that's the thing that like is synonymous, you know what I'm saying, with just blackness in, in the world. Now I wouldn't even limit it to America. And like it's so, you know, it's so you get so used to it, it's it's not even like a, a major thing, although it's such a it's it's something so small, but it is often when it happens that thing that can send you over the edge, you know, and I think that like uh, for me, um, uh, I, I, I saw no reason, you know, to act like, you know, Jay would be good at suppressing his anger. You know what I mean? I saw no reason to like show, you know, how hard he would have to fight to hold it in. Because I think that like, at the end of the day, you know, such an, a simple act, you know, white people cross the street on you is so dehumanizing. You know, it is so angering. And really the only way to, to show somebody, you know what I mean? Like the, the one thing that uh, uh, to me, it seemed like a very important way to show Jay's full humanness, you know what I'm saying? His full, his ability to still access his full range of humanity to show his anger in that moment. Because when we suppress it, we do suppress a little bit of our humanity. Nobody wants to see an angry black person ever. You know, it's the scariest thing in the world for so many people, you know what I mean? And black people, we get so good at, at, at hiding it as existing as if we don't contain that one emotion that everybody else is allowed to have you know and so for me like it was important that in a way jay kind of reclaim his humanity in this last you know kind of um defiant moment regardless of the consequences um to me like it's important that like black people are allowed to be angry at what's going on you know what's happening to them in the city is righteous it's a righteous anger and i don't think that we should shy away from that or act like it's not there you know 
I also want to ask about um, Blue, too. Um, the film focuses really beautifully on sort of the relationships between Black boys who grow into men. Um, as far as women go, we see mothers and grandmothers like holding together Q Street in many ways, being leaders in the, in the neighborhood. Um, but Blue is the only Black woman of the younger generation that we see in the film. Um, we get the sense that she's going through some things, but we don't really see so much of her personal story. Um, how did you think about gender as you made the film? Yeah, I mean, for me, their relationship was was important to kind of just show like this this half formed relationship that could have had potential, you know, that never really reaches any any you know anything substantial, you know, um, because of his own you know kind of immaturity, you know, what I mean, his his own kind of you know he's at this stage and not able to contribute equally, but also like his 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 moments and opportunities for growth, you know, they are there in that, in the film, like in the moment when she's like reaching out, like, yo, like I'm about to leave. Um, his, you know, which is like an extension, you know, an, a, a chance for him to, you know, to kind of rise to the occasion. All those moments for growth are interrupted. You know, I think that's kind of what happens anyway. You know, in many ways, like, yeah, you know, we are backwards. Men are backwards in relationships and our ability to relate to women. But like also part of it has to do with the fact that like many times our opportunities to grow are interrupted by the bullshit that we're experiencing have to deal with in the city. Right when she's about to say like I'm about to, you know, I'm about to leave in that room in that time in his apartment, he goes out to find what has happened to Mike, you know what I mean? And it happens again later on in the film. You know, I think there's like this this constant thing. And, and I think that like that's kind of my idea for the film is that like he's not focused on you know, the white folks, he's not focused on the police, and he's barely focused on blue, you know, despite the fact that we could tell it could be something good, you know, it could, it could be fruitful. Um, and, you know, and also at the same time, I think that, you know, I crystallized many of my own, you know, immaturities in the, in the film, you know, trying to struggle through that relationship and how to depict it, you know, having ended up created also a half-formed character, you know, she's not as fully developed as the other, you know, characters in the film, and that, that is, you know, for me, it was an important process kind of working through, you know, my own, like I said, my own um, shortcomings, you know. Um, but yeah, you know, I think that I think that that was the idea. And so and so doing, you know, in trying to show that he's not focused on her, I, I also created a, a, a less formed character, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to ask the last, one of the last questions that's from me and then move on to questions from the audience. Um, my question is about kind of a community of film or, or artists here in DC and, and what your visions would be for that. Um, I understand that a lot of the cast or most, almost everybody in the cast was from DC or the DC area. Um, and that in itself, I'm sure, formed some kind of local film community. But I was wondering more if each of you could kind of state if you could have, like realize your long term vision or dream for what building a community, I think specifically for black artists, black filmmakers could look like in D.C. What would that dream? What would that dream be? And then maybe like what's one thing you're excited about that's already happening along the way? I can go first. Yeah, go for it. Uh, well, it's funny you say dreams because, you know, and I, I talked to uh, some other people in the cast and crew about it, but one of my dreams was actually, when I was in college, one of my dreams was to make a film about D.C. Uh, you know, I was having a conversation with a few friends of mine from the theater program, and we were all talking about, you know, what we wanted to do, what we wanted to accomplish in like five years, 10 years or whatever, and everybody was saying, you know, I want to work with this actor, I want to work with Leonardo DiCaprio, Will Smith, whatever. And my answer was like, I want to make a film about DC because we don't ever see films um, about DC. There is no film, there are no films about DC, you know, um, about Chocolate City anyway. You know, and usually when you see films about DC, they're about, you know, politics, the White House, you know, Monument, whatever. Um, but, you know, so, you know, just, I just had to throw that out there. But 
my dream would be for just more DC stories to be told. You know what I mean? Like Mariah was saying earlier, it's, there's so many, so many stories in, in DC. On Q Street alone, I remember we were talking, I was talking to, while we were shooting the film, I was talking to a resident on Q Street, uh, Mark, I think his name was, not our cinematographer, but um, there's a, a, another man who lived on the street. His, actually, his kids were in the film. Um, and he was telling me how his family has been in D.C. since like the 1800s, you know what I mean? And he's like trying to, you know, keep that, you know, going. Um, so, you know, it's just, there's just so many. And he was telling me about a book, I guess, um, I guess what I was trying to say. He was telling me about a book he was trying to write, you know, about, I guess, his life and some other things. And that's the story right there. So I think this film, while we were shooting on Q Street, there were a lot of different, uh, uh, you know, people were expressing to me their artistic desires. You know, even Julian, the young man in the film, was was telling me he plays uh, he played the young Demetrius. He was telling me how he wanted to continue acting as well as Christian. Uh, was telling me that he, you know, um, that he had interest in acting. I was just kind of telling him to get into his theater program or his acting program at his school. So, I think with this film, we kind of like started something. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, I. Even after it came out on Netflix, there were a lot of people saying, man, I want to be in the next one. I want to, I want to be in this. I mean, I want to make a film. We did a talk at, you know, at, uh, at this uh, uh, photography studio. And a lot of people were saying how they wanted to, um, they had their own stories about the area and how they wanted to bring to uh, sort of flesh those ideas out. And so, you know, uh, I think the dream is being realized, you know, right now. Um, with just the inspiration that has come, you know, seeing that the film was made by somebody who was born and raised in DC, you know what I mean? People see that as possible. So, you know, I think, you know, that's, that's sometimes that's what it takes, you know, you, you just need to see somebody that that's, you can touch, you know what I mean? Physically touch or somebody you can physically go to um, doing it and that gives you all the inspiration that you need. So, you know, I think the dream is being realized. I, I think this is like a starting point for, you know, a lot of uh, local artists to point, sort of thrive. I'll jump in there. Um, yeah, you know, I feel like um, if if Residue is the last film about DC by, you know, DC natives, Black DC people, about, you know, Black DC people for the next 10 or 12 years, we have failed. You know, there was there was a film about Chocolate City, you know, uh, it's called Jazz in the Diamond District. I don't know if anybody remembers that one, but like that was from like 10 years ago, you know what I mean? And it was like a, also a modest release, you know, many people didn't get to see it, but it was by a sister made that joint uh, probably with no money as well, you know? But like since then, it really is just rather do, you know? And I think that like if the same thing happens again over the next 10 years, yeah, we failed in a big way. You know, my, my hope is that we keep in contact because people have been reaching out. You know, black creatives, DC is overflowing with black creatives, you know, and I think that like, you know, to, you know, to kind of uh, continue to leave behind like the, the filmic knowledge, you know what I mean, of the production of residue is one way, but also to keep the productions coming in, in residue, you know, in, a, in this kind of independent film style really is the path forward for filmmakers who don't have a lot of resources, but have a lot of stories, you know, um, but I think that like, there's a, you know, the, the, the photography place OB was talking about, it's a place called the Dojo. It's down in Capitol Heights and it's just packed with black photographers. You know what I'm saying? It's a space for black photographers and other artists, visual artists, et cetera, to come in. And it's called the Dojo because they just come and practice. You know, they just come and just riff and just try different things. It's so incredible. You know what I mean? It's, it, it reminded me of like, you know, what I wanted to do with, you know, so my parents, we, we have the bookstore you know, Sankofa Bookstore on Georgia Avenue. That's our family shop. And like, you know, we have like a little film distribution thing going on there and like film production. That's where my parents edit their projects and stuff like that. It's a little film hub. And, you know, it would be nice to have something like that. It, the city needs many, you know, dojos, you know what I mean? Places where black creatives can go, you know, get some knowledge, some of the, uh, you know, kind of OGs and whatever that field is come every once in a while and just drop knowledge on folks, you know what I mean? And just kind of practice and just kind of sharpen the blade consistently. Because I think DC is ripe to be some type of like, you know, film, you know, industry hub, you know, pushing in the same direction, in the same way like Array and Ava DuVernay are pushing in the industry on the West Coast, 
DC should be like a satellite pushing as well in the same direction for like black film production and distribution. You know, my father, he was a film professor for 40 years. He does workshops and stuff. Like it's right. The time, you know, I mean, like the, the variables are there, you know. Of course, resources is the is the thing, but you know, yeah, the variables are there. What about you, Dennis? If you could vision your dream for for this kind of like what an artistic community you would want to see would be. Um I've always been a person who would love to see other people happy and prevail. So with this film, just in the reception of everybody, not the fact that Mariah was shattered or OB was in it or I was in it myself, but the fact that it was a film about DC and people to receptive to it. And I feel like it opened, it gave people the courage, the one to put, I feel like people been holding on to a lot of stories they've been wanting to tell for years. Because as soon as the film um, previewed on Netflix, I was getting messages from friends like hey i was can you read this i wasn't they just wanted me to read a script because they had the idea of shooting a film and more people just feeling more confident about it because somebody who was their peer or they may have known growing up or have known this family history when he put together this film this actually maybe the film for dc and, and on this grand scale of netflix where you said the whole world can see it and it's representing us real well and that's like marawi really gave people the confidence. I feel like he opened the door for, for more filmmakers and artists in, in uh, Washington, D.C. area. It's funny because I told Morale he's about to be like the Tyler Perry of D.C. He's going to have his own studio, of uh, own studio in D.C. where it's going to be other filmmakers who can come to the studio and, and work on their craft as well. But just seeing the reception of the film and just want to see more from other people and just see what else they have and just see what the other young actors who was in the film, they want to they wanna continue to, to act and see what they do when they get older. And just myself personally, just wanted to know more about film because I was only there during the days I was going to shoot. But if I'd have known more, I'd have been behind the scenes with Rob or behind the scenes with Mark trying to learn more because it was a great experience. And I feel like with this film, it opened up a lot of doors. And I just want to see people from DC or Merlin, Virginia or the DMV area, just put their stories out. Don't hold it out, just put their stories out. If you got something, um, just put it out. Mariah, one thing he does say, say, green light yourself. Just green light yourself. Don't hold on. If you got something, just green light yourself. Don't matter if you have the money or you feel like you're not competent or capable of doing it. Just go for it because you never know what the outcome will be. And and I would say residue is a prime example of that because this is far from what we expected. <laughs> yeah, green light yourself at all times and under all conditions. Okay, I, we've got to move on to questions from the audience now, and I might even want to steal a few minutes over eight because we have gotten over 50 questions, so we will get to as many as we can. Um, I'm, I'm seeing that there are a lot of questions about the kids in the film, and I'm really glad someone asked this because I wanted to talk about this too. Um, Lori and Ellen asked, um, they said, there were so many great performances from kids in this movie. They feel like such natural family and close friends. How did you find the children who played the young versions of the main characters? And how did you foster that relationship among them? Oh man, I wish, I wish we could go into detail about like how intertwined this whole film was with just our community, you know what I mean? Like, so of course we shot it in the neighborhood where I grew up at, you know, like that's central. And so when I went back, you know, to like start pre-production, you know, I was looking for, yeah, I was looking for kids. It's hard to find kids. We went to like little acting places at Howard, you know, theater and all that kind of stuff. Um, Howard University's, you know, they have a summer program in the theater uh, school, but uh, nah. So Jakari Dai is the kid that plays um, um, young Jay, the young kid with the little short dreadlocks, baby locks. And he's the son of one of my best friends growing up. So when I came back to town, like saw he, I was like, whose kid is that? And Rick was like, yo, that's my son. I was like, yo, like, see if he wants to be in the movie. Like, see if he wants to act. He was like seven at the time. I don't even know if he was like really registering what it meant, you know, to really act in a film. But like, you can see, you can see that boy exists on like a spiritual plane. Or he's just kind of like, you know what I mean? He hears you and like, here's what you're talking about. But like, he's more interested in like the things that he's focused on. So like directing him was, very difficult, you know, because like at that, you know, I think it's very difficult to direct any kid under, you know, under eight, but, you know, we were in his neighborhood, you know what I'm saying, on his turf, all his friends running up and down the street, there was just too many things going on, but, you know, it got, it got easier, the more I was able to kind of 
you know, find a way into his imagination. You know what I mean? So I would say things like, don't you want to go to Demetrius' house? And he ain't got no friends named Demetrius, but he'd be like, yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I was like doing stuff like that. And he would just kind of like go along with it. And in this in-between space of like acting, but like really actually not acting at all. You know what I mean? He just kind of, oh man. Like there was so many scenes that I couldn't use of his, but he just gifted. And that line, my favorite part of the whole entire film is the last lines at the end between the two boys as the film is ending. And half of it was just him going off, you know, I would give them lines and he would go off script to a direction I could not have imagined. You know what I mean? I didn't think I would use that scene, but when it, when it came together, I was like, oh man, what a gift. You know what I mean? But like the other boy that he's talking to, you know, Julian, who, who plays young Demetrius, Julian Selman, that's the son of my sister's best friend growing up, you know, who I was also friends with just because that's how it goes. You know, she lived across the street. Actually, she's the one that lives in the green house. That was her house. You know what I mean? The party is on her back porch. You know what I mean? That hole in the ground, that construction was in our backyard, you know, area. That was the destruction of the Q Street back. You know, it used to be an ice factory that everybody knows about. Nobody knows what it is now. It's alien territory. But yeah, that's how we catch the kids. The guy, OB, was talking about Mark, who lives in the neighborhood. He has like three, four kids. And he, you know, he had two of his sons in there. There's another woman named Amira. She was walking past uh, my parents' bookstore. Oh, she was coming into my parents' bookstore because she's a regular there. And I asked if she wanted to be in a film. She, I was like, she was like, about what? I was like, about DC. And like, literally like, that's all she knew. She was like, oh yes. And, and she knew my parents too. She was like, oh hell yeah. And I got like three kids, like here are their pictures. Do you want any of them for the film? So that's kind of how we, you know, we just, it was like a super community affair. Like, especially the way we, the kids came into the project. Acting, you know, playing their the uh, the generation of their parents. And that's the that's the really dope part to me. It's like it's the kids of my my friends' kids playing our generation. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That is really beautiful. And it's funny you said that Jakar is kind of like in his own world because I love it's it's a small moment, but when he's leaving and his mom's like what time do you need to be home? And he's like, you know, kind of like he hears her, but you know, he's not giving that verbal confirmation. And I feel like that is so like, that's such a, a kid thing. Um, yeah. yeah. But I think a less delicate film crew with more money and a more sharp script wouldn't have been able to, you know, uh, appreciate that, you know, like what he's bringing. Like you have to know how to capture him, you know, specifically because he's not a trained actor. You know, he's not going to look towards the camera. You know what I mean? Yeah, so. Another question, and I, I'm glad someone um, asked this. It's from Phyllis. Um, Phyllis asked, in what way has your filmmaker parents, and, um, you know, for context, your parents are prolific filmmakers. Um, in what way has, has, have they influenced the way in which you approach filmmaking? I mean, well, I'll, I'll just go through it real quick. You know, they, you know, I, I, I grew up as they were trying to self-distribute a film called Sankofa, which was a massive struggle, you know, because they couldn't find regular means of distribution, you know, in the United States, after, even after that, you know, they won awards in literally every festival around the world, you know, but it, of course it's, you know, a, a black film about, you know, revolution during slavery time. So no, you know, distributor, AKA no white distributor, which was the only ones at the time with, would lay a finger on that film. So I grew up passing out flyers and, you know, things at conventions and stuff and just seeing them struggle from film to film to tell these kind of unmitigated black stories. That's one thing. The other thing is that like, you know, they move no matter what. This green light yourself thing comes directly out of that, you know, out of this kind of, you know, a school of filmmaking that my, my, my dad is probably editing right now, you know, at Sankofa, if my mom hasn't made him like, you know, like come home, you know what I mean? Like that's the, that's the, they're just constantly moving, several scripts going, writing, editing, whatever. Um, but um, I also study their films, you know, rigorously, you know, I, I, I appreciate them artistically very, very, very much. And that, and those films of their contemporaries, cause they come out of the so-called LA rebellion filmmakers from the black filmmakers from the seventies who were fighting, you know, left and right you know, uh, uh, to to be able to tell their stories in the way that they wanted to. Um, and so I study, you know, that kind of, you know, those types of films. And they really did design a whole methodology of, you know, creating high production value with very little resources because that was their economic reality, you know. And so I come out of that, directly out of that, 
but in the in the making of the film you know they were there you know like they were you know of course in the and during in the writing you know i maybe sent them a draft or two but like in production they were kind of on the sidelines my dad especially my mother is in the film by the way my mother plays mike's mother miss tanya she's the one in the ring and she wasn't supposed to be she was on set that day it was a crazy day but it was a day where um she was on set you know bringing food for people she was helping my sister with catering and we found that the woman who was cast you know was a no-show so i was like i happened to see my mother as i was hearing the news i was like oh my <laughs> i need you to be in this movie real quick and she was like uh-uh because she knew the scene she knew the whole setup not because she's shy about acting but because like she was in that neighborhood before we were ever born for many years so like the whole story the whole mythology of the whole residue everything is very very um real for her and my dad you know so like she's not acting you know it's important for me to say that like she's not acting you know because she's seen that scene play out many 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 times um but um you know these are the kids that my parents helped to raise that's the point you know like they were on q street helping other parents like everybody's helping everybody scrambling trying to make this thing work um anyway so uh yeah so they were they were there and in the editing of it i had to lean on them heavily you know to show them cuts you know and they're the type of people who give you honest feedback you know because they they're also filmmakers themselves and as a film maker you know when you're in an editing phase you really do need somebody who will give you, you know, very, very sharp, you know, blunt feedback, you know, it's critical, you know. What's an example of some of that, like, sharp, blunt feedback? I mean, I was, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, my, my dad, you know, he uses a lot of cuss words, so maybe it's not directly translatable, but one time I was editing with, um, I was editing the prison scene, <clears throat> you know, the visit, and I had some, like, some flashback at some in, inopportune moment, you know, it was really when, when Jay first gets there, you know, I was trying to do things rather than let it just be silent the way it is now. And then they go, I had something like some flashback come in and, um, in, in very colorful words, he, I showed him, I was proud of it. <laughs> and he was like, yo, like what? I mean, like, I don't, I don't know what you're, you know, like, what are you doing? Like, that's a film school edit. That's like an intellectual edit, you know? It's a very emotional moment and you just co completely, you know, interrupted it, you know, by sending us this other way, you know, to this other flashback. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really translating it well. It was like much more energetic, a lot more cuss words, a lot more da 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 da, -da you know, kind of thing. But the point was like, you know, trust the scene to hold its own. You know what I mean, and to and to and just leave it alone, just leave it alone. And that scene itself, it evolved so much. You know, it wasn't written like that. You know, it was written, of course, with this idea of escape, but it wasn't written in the way that it's shown. It took a, it took many, 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 many months to get it right, and we just happened to have the, enough footage to make it work in mm. that way. And it went through many, many iterations. Hmm. I want to hear maybe this question from Henry, you can kind of get at that in it. Um, because Henry asked and said, you know, there was a dreamlike quality in many scenes with time moving backward and forward, or events and characters mixing together, sometimes in the same scene. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak more to your inspiration and the symbolism behind this. Um, and I think one example of a scene that is dreamlike in that way is the scene where you are transported from the prison to the woods um, in the scene when, when Jay is visiting Dion. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll say that, you know, that scene specifically was, you know, that kind of came out of, I, I had, like I said, it wasn't written as, you know, as, you know, in the way that it is shown, it was written differently. And really when I was writing it, I was just trying to channel my own ideas of how my conversation would go and an upcoming conversation that I was going to have with one of some, you know, one of my friends who was like, a, and so for me, I was just trying to imagine how that conversation would go. And so that's kind of how the scene is, because you want to talk to somebody who's locked up. You want to, you know, emphasize how much you love them. You want to tell them like all these warm things. And, you know, a prison itself really is, you know, the opposite of that. You know, a prison is, you know, a place designed to just dehumanize and, you know, destroy any chances at real human connection. And so for me, like they had to escape at a certain point. So that's kind of where that came out of. But 
you know, if you watch any one of my, my parents' films, you know, it will contextualize residue further. You know, stylistically, I, I, I borrow much from them. You know, there it's a wellspring that I'm constantly pulling from. The last thing is that, um, you know, our economic, you know, reality dictated a lot of the stylistic choices that we had. You know, a lot of it was poorly shot, not because the cinematographer, you know, he, he did the damn thing. You know, you could tell frame by frame, he really shot it well. When I say it was poorly shot, I mean like, the directing choices, my own inexperience, you know, lack of footage or lack of coverage or lack of things required me to, you know, go find creative solutions in the editing room, you know. So a lot of the editing came out of me trying to make the film work because as it was shot, you know, it couldn't have worked without, you know, these kind of, you know, it, it forced me into that, into that style, you know. So it wasn't ever like a, a kind of calculated stylistic choice. Mm. So sometimes you're saying basically that switching back and forth a location meant that you were putting together basically the material that you had. Yeah, you know, if you think about um, the drive-by uh, moment, you know, it was that whole concussion sequence was a sequence, it was a series of scenes that were simply were not working, you know. Um, he gets knocked out and then a couple other scenes happen and they, they did not work sequentially because they weren't written properly, therefore they weren't shot properly. And therefore, in the editing room, I had to find a way to make it work. And so it ended up being this kind of concussive goulash of like ideas and memories and all this stuff. But that was critical. You know what I mean? Like, I can't say that like it was it ended up less than it could have been if I shot it better. Like it was critical that I was put against the wall like that because it allowed me to really have that concussive sequence be like the moment where all his, you know, kind of memories start you know, gushing forward, you know, all these memories that he's unable to access, you know, in the earlier part of the film. So this inaccessibility of his memories, the blurred out memories, that only became a thought after I found the concussive sequence to work, you know, then I was like, okay, well, shit, if the memories are crispy clear here, let me just make them blurry early on and hard to access. And this, this whole idea started to develop and the film took on a new life that I couldn't have imagined, you know, at the script level. Yeah, that's fascinating because I feel like that scene is where so many of the themes of the film come together. And when you see that collapse of the timeline, it, you kind of understand that. I feel like that's the sequence when you're like, oh, this movie is about Q Street, but it's also about everything about how this city works. Yeah. Um, this is kind of related. Um, and I guess maybe we didn't really get at this so clearly. So I'm glad that Mary asked this question. Um, Mary asked, how much was autobiographical? was the early film footage from your childhood? And then along with it, anonymous question asker said, um, is Delonte based on an actual resident of Key Street or is just an archetype? Yeah, I mean, um, this is definitely about my life. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I think at a certain point I was trying to hide that, you know what I mean? But it was, it was very clear, you know, early on that like once we were filming in my neighborhood, the folks I grew up with, you know, the stories, you know, the mythology of my own neighborhood. Mythology is not the right word because these are real stories, but, you know, it was all about me, you know what I mean? And I think at a certain point, we just started allowing that to be what it was, started leaning into it more and more. You know, uh, it's about a filmmaker who comes. Actually, when we started filming, he had no occupation. I didn't want to say, you know, he was a filmmaker coming home to film his neighborhood because I just felt like at that point, it would just be too clear that it was about me. But finally, once I got over that, you know, I allowed it to be what it was trying to be. And then, you know, kind of we got to where we are now. So, of course, it's my childhood, my my current reality, all that. And OB maybe can get into it. But like we had a, we had a, uh, we had to work through that, you know, because it was clearly about me. And at the same time, he didn't want to just be a Marawi character actor, you know, kind of thing. He was trying to, influ you know, introduce his own characteristics. So. OB, please pick it up. But we had to find a way to like start blending it, you know what I mean? How much of me, how much of him? Yeah, I mean, I was, I think just as an actor, I was just trying to find, I was trying to take pieces from Marawi's life while trying to use what was in the script, you know, for context. Uh, you know, and so, so I would look, I asked him one time where we were shooting, is this autobiographical? And I think he's trying to, he kind of avoided the question sometimes, but I, I kind of caught on eventually um, and just started to pick certain things from his life, you know, like his relationship with his father, his relationship with his mother, you know what I mean? Little subtle things like that that I would try to pick up on, you know, because we didn't have time to do 
any research, you know, it was a lot of it was just pick up and go. So I had to rely on Marawi just, you know, sometimes just watching him, watching how he interacts with certain people, you know, because I, you know, I think I was probably the first one to figure it out that it was autobiographical. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just try to pick up little subtle things, um, you know, while we were shooting, you know, to kind of fully form this character because I didn't have anything to go off of. We didn't have a script really, you know. We were just kind of like, Marawi would set the camera down, kind of give us a blueprint for what the scene was about. And then we'd have to like kind of figure it out as we went along. So yeah, a lot of it was just me, you know, pulling from, you know, little things from his life. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it, it does. Um... Yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's pretty interesting. And and it's interesting to hear that, like, of course you guys had to had to confront that head on in the filming. Um, okay, I know we are over time. Uh, so I'll just ask Kareem's last question, which is, um, was the scene close to the opening sequence where the white neighbor tells o, um, Jay or Obi uh, to turn down his music, a shout out to Spike Lee? And if so, are there other Spike Lee influences in the film? Um, no, nah, no, nah, that was actually a, um, a moment, uh, me and my dad kind of pulled up to the neighborhood and we were kind of just doing some work around, around the house and like this dude, we did not know, you know what I mean? This white dude who we, I'd never seen before just started, you know, came out of nowhere to start like trying to run shit, you know, trying to, you know, bark on orders and, you know, telling us what to do. I think my, uh, it was like some street parking sign or something. Nobody asked him, you know what I mean? He just kind of decided that he wanted to, you know, kind of volunteer something. I don't know, you know. And um, <laughs> it was a moment, you know, because my dad was there and he don't play that shit. But I think that, like, it was a very, you know, early experience about, like, where where this whole thing was headed, you know. Uh, so that's kind of where that came out of. Um, um, if uh, Spike Lee, I mean, I, I think, you know, Crooklyn would have been a film, you know, I, I was very, it is a film, I, you know, I, I like very much. I think one of his, you know, for me, most impactful films. And I think that if Residue is kindred with his work, you know, you know, I think Crooklyn is a place to look for sure. Um, sorry, were you about to close it down? I just saw a question about sound design. I thought it was cool. Oh, answer it. Please read it and answer it. Uh, sound plays a character in the movie. It's used amazingly to illustrate the real threats and lasting effects of the main character's PTSD and anxiety from childhood from crack era DC while introducing the new threat of gentrification. How much attention and detail went into the sound design in the process of both, of both pre and post production? So, you know, for me, um, like I, I so if I, if, if I had a track at USC, it's not really a school where you track, everybody doesn't track. I didn't. But sound was definitely my main focus while I was there. Um, so like, I would say from the script level, I was thinking of ways that like, you know, sound would kind of play into the film. And it turned out to actually be one of the best producerial tools, you know, to really bring the cost down, you know, to enable us to shoot scenes that we ne otherwise wouldn't have been able to shoot, you know. So, you know, the police, for example, we don't see them of course, because, you know, story-wise, OB, you know, he's focused on his on his folks, you know, he's not focused on police or white people or nothing like that, but also because we can't afford to show y'all, you know, what the police look like, you know. But I think that, like, it was our economic kind of restrictions forced us into these really important creative solutions, you know, because um, we, um, we would then have to find a way around the fact that we can't afford a police uniform or police car but like when I start, you know, then digging for solutions, I'm forced to to retreat back into my memories or into like this 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 creative space and to be more honest in that moment anyway. So like if you think again about the drive-by sequence, uh, you know, drive-by moment, you know, uh, I remember being in the car. You know, my mother kind of gets out the car and she's walking around. And like we hear screeching tires and like gunshots. And then I was craning my neck trying to see what was happening, but I couldn't because it was like a wall of like my six siblings, five siblings, you know, around me pushing everybody down to the ground. So I couldn't see what was happening anyway. And so it became like a more honest, creative, you know, and I, I think just a better way to represent that scene in his memory, you know, and so it forced us into better positioning anyway, you know, that I just felt like. So to me, sound is critical throughout the film. 
the other thing is I like to, you know, y'all yeah, know about those like recordings where they record, they, uh, they play recordings of like bullfrogs in the rainforest from like the mm -hmm. 70s in order to like show how bullfrogs have, you know, are um, going extinct or some, you know, some animal or something is going extinct. They'll play the recording from the 70s and then they'll play a recording from that same rainforest in like 2010 or something. And like everything's there except the bullfrogs and the audio track. That's kind of the idea for the soundtrack is like, you know, I wanted to record, you know, uh, what it sounds like now, which is so sterile and dead on Q Street, you know, no, no culture at all, you know, barely any people outside, as opposed to how it used to be when I was a kid, you know, everybody hanging off every porch, you know, every window, music, all up and down the street, people outside, cars everywhere, you know what I mean? Bucket drummers, all that. You know, uh, and to kind of, you know, uh, juxtapose these, you know, the soundful kind of audioscape soundscape next to this completely dead, you know, soundscape. And to me, you know, like that was the idea was to, to try and capture the sound in a, in a full expression to show what what has been, you know, what, you know, what has been destroyed, you know, to show the obliteration, you know. Mm -hmm. And that goes back kind of to the like archivist role. Yeah. 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 Okay, I know that we are all over time, um, so I want to let everyone get to their evening, but um, did any of the three of you have any final thoughts that you wanted to leave us with before we close? I just want to say I appreciate you, you know, thank you for, you know, throwing us up and uh, making this happen. Jenny, it was, it was an absolute pleasure to meet you, and thank you for inviting us. Thank yeah, you. likewise. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, once again, green light yourself. I'm going to use a uh, quote morale again. Green light yourself with anything that you want to do. And definitely appreciate you all for having us. Same. Well, thank you all for being here. And, and thank you all in the audience for, um, for coming out to your Zooms. Uh, and um, thank you for the film. I think it, it does mean a lot to have a film. Um, that creates a record of, of what this city has been going through. Um, and uh, so I appreciate it as well. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, take care. Thank you. Bye. Peace. Uh, Jenny, should we also log out? <laughs>